Well, I, I got involved in Scientology at the insistence of my mother because hypnosis works pretty well. I, all right, I mean, I got some Dianetic auditing. It seemed to work. I didn't know what worked at the time. I had no, I didn't know anything about hypnosis or suggestion. And I, so I attributed it to Hubbard's greatness. Arnie Lerma was, in my opinion, and many others, a true pioneer and hero amongst the ex-Scientology spokespersons. He came up with this thing called 10 Steps Out of Scientology, which briefly shows the various steps that a Scientologist goes through when they come out of Scientology. There's a way into Scientology, and then there's a way out. And in order to recover, you have to actually walk all the way out. Many people, as you're going to see in this video, I'm going to give you an example, pitch their tent somewhere along these certain levels. Very few actually deprogram from the whole thing and realize it's all horseshit. It's all a con. All of it. That's a hard stage to get to. And people coming out of Scientology will tell you, and I can vouch for this, that they go through fantastic transformations in their perceptions, in their personality, and their whole life changes. I went through this process, which we're going to talk about specifically in detail in season three on the series. But let's talk informally about the subject of deprogramming, about getting out of Scientology. And I'm going to show you um, some examples and I'm going to answer uh, a particular viewer's question that's pertinent to this particular subject. So without further ado, let's get into it. And I introduce to you Arnie Lerma's the 10 steps out of the cult of Scientology. Holy shit, there's something wrong here. If this is so great, then why is blank going on? Insert whatever atrocity you have recently witnessed. The guys at the top must be crazy. Miss Cabbage and crew, they're the evil demons from another dimension. Hubbard just went crazy at the end. Hubbard went crazy in 1966. Holy shit, Hubbard was mad as a frickin' hatter from the start. Oh my god, this whole thing is a complete fraud. Oh my god. God, it's a criminal organization with criminal convictions all over the world, and it was only about frickin' money. The realization that there are no OTs there, not one. Realizing after leaving Scientology that this in fact makes one an ex-Nazi and wanting to do something about it. The part of Scientology that works is the lawyers. Okay, so step one here. Let's break these down, shall we, my friends? So, number one, there's something wrong here. If this is so great, meaning Scientology, then why is blank going on? Insert whatever atrocity you have recently witnessed. This step, my friend, can take people so freaking long to figure out. i recalling Leah Remini's story and many other people's story where you know the tech works. Understand you've already been brainwashed that Scientology is, has a technology to free you. And once you get a taste of that and you believe in that, the standard subconscious programming or suggestion is that the tech and Hubbard are infallible. Therefore, if you're witnessing something wrong, um, this is the beginning or can be the beginning of your wake-up process. So because we don't, doubt um, Hubbard or the tech, myself included, you know, when I was in Scientology, when you see things that are wrong happening, you just write reports, you try to get things fixed, you know, it's anybody but Hubbard, anybody but David Miscavige, it's usually your fault. And if it's not your fault, then it's somebody else's fault. And you just handle it all internally with the ethics conditions and all sorts of things. But every once in a while, especially if you've been in for a while, maybe you'll see that the org is kind of empty. And then maybe you see bad behavior or the statistics are falsified or any number of things that can happen after you've been in for a while that make you start wanting to fix Scientology, wanting to, you know, handle it. And again, they have a whole procedure where you write up lines to, you know, somebody, I'm having such and such problem, I just witnessed so-and-so, and then it circles back around where... It gets fixed or it doesn't. It's circular logic and on and on it goes. So this first step can take forever for you to finally go beyond 
that, you know, something bad is happening here into step two, where it says the guys at the top must be crazy. Okay, I see what's going on here. Again, it's not Miss Cabbage yet. It's not the dead L. Ron Hubbard. It's the freaking management that you're dealing with. It's your particular org or mission where you're getting services from. It's a particular executive director or mission holder. I don't believe they have missions anymore, but back in the day, it was the mission holder's fault. It was, you started to realize that management up at the top was corrupt, right? Step three. Now, this is where we have the indie Scientologists and where so many ex-Scientologists hang out at for a long time. People can spend a lifetime on this particular one. And that is Miscavige and crew are evil demons from another dimension or something similar. So this, this is what sparked this particular, this week's cult clip is because I'm going to show you a discussion between uh, a Scientologist or ex-Scientologist who actually got to step 10, it appears, and, you know, doesn't believe in any of it, and an indie Scientologist. And they had a little fight, uh, not fight, but a, a very interesting discussion uh, on this thread on the Danny Masterson video. To be continued on that. So this Miscavige and crew are evil demons from another dimension. This is what happens when, this is the power of the brainwashing and the power of believing in the technology. I got to tell you, when I had auditing without any other frame of reference that I was being hypnotized and I could access that state of mind elsewhere through other techniques if I wanted to, I really was sold on the idea that no matter what else happens, the Scientology technology is special. I've never felt this way before. It definitely works. Therefore, finally, you might get lucky and go, Miss Cabbage is the SP or suppressive person or sociopath. He's the one that's fucking up Scientology. But I still believe in Hubbard. I'm still going to practice this technology outside of the church. These... In, they're called indie Scientologists, and they're a very special breed. I'm not trying to be mean or, you know, um, or I'm not trying to discount their experiences. It's just they're, I've had many interactions with these people, and it's so mind-boggling to me personally, being out of this for over a decade. How can't, I mean, I know why, but how can't they see the obvious? Can't they just go that next step and realize that actually Hubbard and the tech, and it's all a fraud? Um so anyways, that's where the indies hang out at. And then if you're lucky and you get to the next step, Hubbard went crazy at the end. Okay, so now they're starting to see, wait a minute, the tech was good, but then Hubbard, I guess, fell off at the end and went mad and shit. This is when the deprogramming starts more and more and you start maybe questioning Hubbard or seeing, God, he seems like he went a little fucking nuts at the end. You keep justifying it because you can't yet see the bigger picture, right? You're still in the forest and it's all about pulling back your perception, usually over many, many years, if you're lucky, to see the entire picture, to connect all the dots. So the next one is Hubbard went crazy uh, in 1966. Well, okay, so now the tech was good in the early days, Dianetics was good, all of the communication courses, but then he started to go wacko and it got to this OT, glare fight, fucking bodies and pawn type shit around 1966-ish. That's when he went crazy. I'm just going to hold on to the basic technology and just practice a communication course because Hubbard definitely had that part right. The next step, should you progress beyond that, is Hubbard was mad from the start. Now, this is a massive breakthrough that people can make when they start to, because this can unravel the whole thing. Once you realize that Hubbard's a psychopath, and please check out the interviews with H.G. Tudor. We did two of them, and a the third one's coming up next month where he does a fantastic job of breaking down specifically narcissists and sociopaths or psychopaths. And they have particular characteristics where once you really lock in on that, specifically they have no conscience um, and they can never change no matter what, no matter how much persuasion, they cannot change. So this one is really key and can make, can make you start unraveling who you were actually dealing with with Hubbard Get into his hypnosis aspects, which will answer for you why you got blown out of your mind and the auditing and the training. And then also into his background, the magic affirmations or the magical background, his affirmations and a whole bunch of cr you know, crazy shit and lies and fake military career. This is when you can really start to make some progress in that. Now, number seven, this whole 
thing is a complete fraud. Now you're really on the way out, but you might still be holding on to the tech. The language of Scientology sticks forever in your brain, and you actively have to try to get this, think a new way. Get these, stop thinking and stop speaking in Scientology terms. That's around step seven here, where this whole thing is a complete fraud, where that kind of huge transformation or beginning of a transformation can actually start. Number eight, my God, it's a criminal organization with criminal convictions all over the world. And it was only about money. It's actually about money and power and shit. And there's a little bit more to it than that. But this step eight here, this is when you start to realize the extensive crime mafiosa um, connected uh, huge conspiracy, criminal conspiracy that Scientology actually is. And there's endless document, documented evidence on that. And we'll be going into much more detail as to just how bad that particular part is. Number nine is the realization that there are no OTs there. There's no clears. The state of clear doesn't exist. It's impossible. There's not one OT and one clear. The technology was all bogus. And this is, again, when you can start regaining some of your own personality back and getting rid of Hubbard's toxic thinking out of your head. Number 10 is when you come full circle and you realize after leaving Scientology that this makes one an ex-Nazi and the desire to do something about it. Arnie Lerma is not joking about that. Um, I, when I realized how I treated my friends, you're taught to look down on homeless people. You're taught to look down on anybody that's having a hard time. I mentioned earlier, it's a very rich man's snobby cult and it creates an unbelievable arrogance that can take a long, long time to be humbled and to be put down to size and start, um, start grounding yourself in reality and get your humanity and your heart back. I went from one to 10, literally in a single day, in about 20 to 30 minutes, when, as I mentioned before, a cult book was dropped off on my doorstep. That does happen sometimes to people. It's kind of unusual. Normally, this can take a lifetime. And a lot of people, like I said, can spend a lifetime at level three, where they just think it's Miscavige's fault. They become independent Scientologists and practice a technology outside of it. And there's many people that are spokesperson in the ex-Scientology community that you guys watch if you follow Scientology that, act, that actually have not gotten past that point. We'll be talking all about them in due time. And this is why I don't like the controlled opposition, by the way, and the limited hangout people and why they're not honest and open about it, because it's just my opinion. But until you've really spent the time fully deprogramming you're not only not going to be a good example or help people, you know, get out. All you're going to do is reprogram in, reprogram them into how far you got out. So if you still love L. Ron Hubbard technology and you just think it's David Miscavige and you're acting as a spokesperson doing YouTube channels uh, all about how anti-Scientology you pretend to be, you're damaging the crap out of someone and you're lying to them and you're lying to yourself. Now, let me give you a quick little example of how this plays out in the real world. I'm gonna show you a little thread that happened on the Danny Masterson rape allegations video. And if you haven't checked it out, please check that out so you understand what we're talking about here. But this is an example of a level three Scientologist, i.e. Someone who just thinks it's David Miscavige's fault and therefore has left the church, but totally believes in the L. Ron Hubbard technology. This is a gal who's been in for 27 years and has family members in. So, you know, the sunk cost fallacy plays a part in this. To give up what she believes in, to let this go and consider um, what Mark, a level 10 Scientologist, was trying to say to her is tantamount to having your life implode on you, but it's also an opportunity to wake up. When I say uh, Mark's a level 10 Scientologist, that means you're gonna be hearing a few snippets of somebody who, like I uh, and others, have discovered all 
of Scientology is bullshit. And this got under my skin a little bit, but I've had so many of these conversations that I'm pretty numb on it and I don't engage too much because talking to someone who is brainwashed, which is what they are, um, is impossible. Every single thing that they, they see through a filter, right? Scientology and any religion or belief system that people have, it's like a filter. So it blocks out all other sorts of information that would normally be available in a healthy discussion or a healthy discovery. But this is what Scientology and other cults and other brainwashing machines do to people. So she jumps on this freaking Danny Masterson thing a couple days ago and says, Scientology has their own internal justice system, which, if applied correctly, should have resolved this matter 20 years ago. However, Maybe these women finally decided to leave the church. These are the women that are accusing, you know, Danny Masterson of alleged rape. Maybe these women finally decided to leave the church for other reasons. So now is a convenient time to resurrect their rape allegations. Since they were planning to leave the church anyways. One question to answer is, and here's where the Scientology filter system kicks in. What justice actions did the church take in order to address this situation to everyone's satisfaction? Again, this gal, bless her heart, cannot see that there's anything at all wrong with Hubbard or Scientology or anything. It's strictly Miscavige's fault. So she doesn't realize how offensive and ridiculous and robotic, and she's just repeating what she had downloaded into her mind by Scientology that she's supposed to think with and say, she doesn't realize, like I didn't when I was in this Truman Show bubble, how insensitive, ridiculous, and callous you come across. So anyways, this guy named Mark, who you know clearly has gotten out of Scientology, uses a lot of um, facts and evidence and a lot of good humor to try to you know talk some sense into her or just state the facts. He talks about you know the affirmations that Hubbard put out, um, the fact that everything works in a circular logic. He recognizes that she's trying to handle his disagreement. He's been there and done that, but she, you know, can't see that. So at the bottom of this thing, it's like goes on forever. And she just says in response to no matter what evidence he points out, he even provides links, you know, so she can check it out herself. She says, I'm sorry to hear that you had some bad experiences at three different orgs. I have also had disagreements with the way the church has been managed, especially after Miscavige took over. Again, level three Scientologist, which was a huge transition for the church. However, there are not supposed to be any secret orders, and there is even a policy that strictly forbids secret orders or hidden data, blah, blah, blah. Again, Mark's trying to point out how everything's kept compartmentalized, like we talked about a million times. Scientologists have no idea about the secret OSA orders. Those are the little secret uh, CIA intelligence operatives. They have special orders that the public never finds out about. There's all sorts of different uh, information that you learn as you go higher and higher up that the public is absolutely unaware of. And even though she has access to the internet and could check this out, again, once the Scientology program is running, it's very difficult to break. Bless her heart. Uh, and she says, I never heard of the affirmations, Mark. And since it's not proven to be written by LRH, it's irrelevant in this discussion. They have been proven. And if you take any religion, what do they say? It's not, God didn't say it. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Quran. It's not in, in Hubbard's book. It's like, dude, try looking into your cults or religions origins. Try thinking for yourself would be my advice because I wish I would have learned this a lot sooner. Why do you have to think within the dictates, uh, especially of a psychopath? Anyways, um, you know, it, it ends with, with um, Suzanne saying that She tries to, like I did a million times as a Scientologist, handle Mark or try to find out what the fuck is the actual problem. It's never Scientology. She tries to find where he went wrong in his Scientology that made him disgruntled, which is what she, I mean, she watched that Danny Masterson video. I couldn't have been any clear about how it kind of works and the gaslighting and stuff. And yet she interprets it in a way that's totally 
different than anything that was actually said. I want to give you one more example. You know, I have no idea if my parents have actually seen any of these, these videos. I assume that the church, the you know, two days later after I put out the first video about 14 months ago now, I thought my mother and particularly my father were going to be at my door flanked on both sides by two fake um, military people in known as the Sea Org to try to handle me and get me to stop talking online negatively about Scientology. Um, I'm sure that they've been contacted. Um, I have no idea what's going on with that, nor do I give a shit. Um, but this is, this is, um, this is so fucking challenging to break, especially like Suzanne, you know, she has family that's been in there. She talked about how she's hanging in there despite church management. Remember those 10 steps we went over? Just to find out that something's wrong takes a long time. And then when you do, you're going to go around in circles. Like I said, it's a self-referentiating, self-reinforcing feedback loop. So because you can't think outside of Scientology and actually see what's going on, you're programmed to always handle it with L. Ron Hubbard or Scientology policy. That's the hardest thing to break. Once you can get out of that, everything else falls. Waking up out of Scientology was by far the most challenging. That's an understatement. Um, it was the most challenging experience that I will ever have in my life. And it's also, I've told my friends often that ask about this. It's the greatest gift I've ever been given because it gave me, as they say in the Bible, the eyes to see and the ears to hear. I, I would do, knowing what I know now, I would give anything to have broken out of that and to live the rest of my life the way that I live it now. It hardened me up. It took me from a frightened little boy to a lot of learning experiences that just basically, let me explain it this way. There's a huge power dynamic shift. I used to have to bow down to L. Ron Hubbard, to what my parents said, to what the Scientology doctrine demanded that I live my life around. So I was afraid of and controlled by a psychopath. Once I woke up to what was going on, I saw L. Ron Hubbard for who he really was. A little boy in short trousers, a bully, a pussy, a complete coward, and just seeing him how tiny he really was. The power shift was such that I went from being Oh my God, what am, what's going to happen if I don't follow the rules to what a fucking joke. The, it took a long time. It took over a decade. It almost killed me. I did want to suicide myself. I lost everything temporarily. But like I said in a previous video, no price is more worth paying for me than having my mind and my life and my perceptions set free so I can see what the fuck's happening. And I can just tell you from personal experience, when you do that, um, slowly but surely, your self-confidence, your ability to look at yourself in the mirror, your being able to sleep at night, uh, knowing that you did the right thing, that's something my parents um, don't have. And I don't hate them. I wanted to kill them for the longest time. There was a whole blow up um, which we'll talk about later that happened. But on the other side of that, I don't hate them. I feel bad for them. You know, despite everything they put me through, I, after all the emotional trauma, I mean, it's still going to be there forever. But trust me, I spent a lot of time processing this. I wouldn't want to be in their position and I wouldn't want to exit this world I have this vision where my parents, right before they pass, I'm not saying this happens, but I just think about this and it gives me the shudders. What if you passed, you know, in this life and for a split second, right when you die, you realize that everything that you thought was a lie and everything that you did was wrong. That gives me nightmares and makes me shudder at 
if I would have died still being a Scientologist. <laughs> I've also described to my friends, you know, that have asked about the Scientology experience. I describe it like this. I got as close to metaphorically shaking hands with the devil without becoming him. I got as close to evil as you can get, and I became that myself. I thought I was a sociopath. The whole process of waking up out of that um, taught me so, so much and opened my fucking eyes to the scale of evil in this world and being able to look at it without flinching. Uh, you know, I'm going to close this off by having Arnie Lerma, who would definitely know about this, Talk about some of the reasons why you wouldn't maybe do the thing that you know to be right deep inside and why you might not challenge evil and just go along with the pact. There's a lot more to come here, my friends. Um, have a good day, and I'll see you soon. They bought off all the other complainants. They made their lives miserable, then offered them money. Lawrence described that as the carrot and the stick. They make your life miserable, then they offer you a bunch of cash to go away. And between the two, you know, it's, it's like an offer you can't refuse. Unless you, you think you are on a mission, perhaps from God. Because that's what it takes to stand up to them. Yes. You're, it, it's evil. It is evil. Yeah. But without truth, you have nothing. So there's nothing to lose by going after them. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. You know what I mean?